I was recently reading some comments where someone suggested that transit and railways just aren't a good solution for our cities. Because not unlike the highways that urbanists so often complain about, rail corridors through city centers from Zurich to Tokyo to, yes, Toronto, are wide and imposing barriers to those who are walking. Now, despite what you might think, I don't entirely disagree with this point. And I think it's important to recognize that transit isn't perfect as we move towards a future where we're going to have a lot more of it. That said, does this argument really hold any water or is it missing the forest for the trees? Let's talk about it. The idea that rail corridors in city centers can be problematic is not entirely wrong, but it also lacks so much important nuance. And to be fair, the internet is a nuance-free zone, so let's break down why that is. First, let's talk about the negative effects of highways and rail corridors on cities, in particular city centers, where cities tend to be densest and highways and rail corridors are most noticeable. To start, rail corridors are basically universally quieter than highways, and they'll almost always move less discrete vehicles than you'll see on a highway. At the same time, the efficient and low friction means of transportation that is steel wheels on steel rails means you tend to have a lot less noise just from the vehicles themselves. It's also worth pointing out that the incredibly dangerous and frustrating trend of people trying to recreate 2000s driving movies on your local highway just isn't a problem that rail corridors face. Pollution is another major concern, and once again, rail corridors, even diesel rail corridors like we see in Toronto, are far, far less polluting than highways. That's because even diesel trains have large, efficient engines and run on smooth steel rails. Of course, in a climate like Toronto, you also never have to worry about road salt, which creates a ton of problems for your infrastructure. Of course, today in 2022, it's completely conceivable that your entire rail corridor and all of the traffic traveling over it is 100% electric. And honestly, it's more likely than not. Toronto is a real oddball having a large rail corridor that isn't currently electrified, and it is getting electrified in the not so distant future. And that means in most cases, a major rail corridor is going to be nearly zero emissions. Of course, in many senses too, highway pollution isn't even the worst safety hazard that highways bring. Even though highways are, relatively speaking, compared to other roads, actually quite safe, highways are still very dangerous. By comparison, there are a decent number of rail systems out there which have had zero serious safety incidents in their history. Of course, highway ramps and high speed and volume traffic are also incredibly difficult to manage. And that generally means that any location that's even relatively close to a highway on the road network tends to be unsafe for anyone not in a steel bubble. At the same time as being less dangerous, less noisy, and less polluting in general, rail corridors can provide much more connectivity, even local connectivity, which highways just really struggle at. The main issue here is that on and off ramps for a highway just tend to take up a lot of space, and that's inevitable based on the small number of vehicles and the fact that vehicles actually have to physically leave the corridor to transport people to places off of it. Of course though, besides taking up lots of space, highway on and off ramps actually make the highway more dangerous and less effective, and so having lots of them is just generally a huge disbenefit. By comparison, providing local travel capacity on a major rail corridor is really straightforward since you can have relatively narrow platforms at a basic station that can serve even just a small portion of the total trains which pass through. And since the train can simply stop at the platform and let people off, and then they can then climb or descend stairs, you don't need giant curves or loops of asphalt in order to get people off of the transportation artery. At the same time, while well, cars coming off a highway will easily overwhelm a downtown street grid, as you'll probably know if you've been in any downtown that has a highway nearby, people coming from a rail service just generally will not, because people without cars around them tend to be quite space efficient. This ability to co-locate very high quality local all the way up to intercity travel capacity in one corridor is part of what makes rail so useful. But I think one of the issues we tend to run up against in these discussions is the what if that road promoters will bring up, which is that, well, clearly we just don't create enough road space for all of the cars. So let's go macro scale here to see the problem. This is one of the busiest highways in the entire world, Ontario Highway 401 through Northern Toronto. And it is quite literally a critical economic and transport artery for the city. This section is one of the busiest, moving well over 400,000 vehicles every single day with over 10 lanes of traffic. 
That means this section of the 401 can move on the order of 800,000 individual people every single day, assuming we're generous with the number of people on average in each vehicle, which tends to be one. Not including the giant interchanges that dot a major highway like the 401, the corridor here is about 90 meters wide, which is actually narrower than the widest point of the downtown rail corridor in Toronto, which is at Union Station and is around 110 meters wide. But that's not really fair. Union Station is necessarily wide because it is essentially a transportation interchange, and it features various features that other parts of a corridor wouldn't, like platforms, elevators, escalators, stairs, and other amenities. Fortunately, it still manages to be quite space efficient, since again, unlike with highways, people can interchange between various transportation services at a major rail station by simply walking up or down a level at low speeds, instead of having giant loops or curves that allow people to connect from one transportation corridor to another, you simply have a wide open space that people can navigate on foot. If we actually look at the narrowest point on the downtown rail corridor in Toronto, which is a much more fair comparison with any arbitrary point on Highway 401, we see that the rail corridor, which carries 10 tracks, is only about 40 meters wide. Of course, ultimately what we really want to know is how many people we can move in that space. And as it turns out, one of the many services that runs through Union Station gives us a good idea of how many people we could expect to move on those 10 tracks in the future, with works like electrification and better signaling. The Young Subway, or Toronto's Line 1, can already move around 30,000 people in each direction per hour, on just two tracks which take up about 8 meters in width. Signaling upgrades that are already going on on the line are going to push that beyond 35,000. This means that at the narrowest point on the Union Station Rail Corridor, with just 10 tracks, we should easily be able to move at least 150,000 people every single hour. And that's without even considering that the above ground nature of the tracks at Union Station means that it can handle enormous trains that are more than twice as long as the subway trains we see on Line 1, but also have two levels. All of this means that in less than half the width of the 401, the Union Station Rail Corridor in downtown Toronto can handily move more than twice as many people. That means compared to a fairly safe, efficient, and rapid highway, the Union Station Rail Corridor could quite realistically move more than four times as many people in the same given space. And we're talking about a city centre here. Can you imagine what it would be like to try to put something as space consuming as Highway 401 through a downtown of a city? Well, we don't necessarily need to imagine, since the Gardner Expressway already exists. And despite being less than half the size of the 401, it already creates traffic chaos anytime it gets marginally busy in downtown Toronto. And of course, people hate the Gardner and already want it to be removed at the size it is today, because it creates a generally unpleasant environment for everyone around, local drivers included in that. That's not even the worst of it though. If we needed to move everyone, we're planning on moving with rail into the city centre with highways, we would need an enormous amount of space. Union Station, as I said, is a hub for at least nine different major rail lines, and roughly fits into about this space. By comparison, the interchange between just two major highways, each of which has a capacity similar to a single rail line, is several times larger. If you tried to connect the number of places the average downtown does with rail with highways, well, you wouldn't have any space left for a downtown. And that's before you deal with the enormous cost of parking, pollution, local traffic, and everything else that would come along with all of those cars. Now, some might argue that a city centre highway network could simply be put underground, but that's not really realistic based on the examples that exist out there today. Basically, every major underground urban expressway network has far fewer lanes than the major highways we've talked about today, like Highway 401. Most have four, maybe six lanes. A good way of validating this is by looking at one of the world's most highway-laden cities, Los Angeles. What you'll quickly notice is that its downtown, which is surrounded by highways, doesn't have any significant underground tunneled expressways. At the same time, undergrounding existing highways is extremely difficult. Some of the most famous engineering blunders in recent years and decades have been Boston's Big Dig and Seattle's SR99 tunneled replacement, which have been both enormously expensive and enormously delayed for questionable benefit. And that's in part because building road tunnels is just simply really difficult. That's in part because cars today and for the foreseeable future release toxic exhaust fumes. They frequently crash, have a tendency to light on fire when they do crash, require much more space because unlike rail vehicles, they're not on rails, and need really complicated entrance and exit facilities much larger than railway stations to actually access the roadways. 
All of this means that even if you did have the funds to build a massive underground tunnel network under a major metropolitan center, it probably wouldn't make sense to use any substantial portion of that for highways, because rail could move so many more people in the same tunnels. And I think that's well validated, because one of the largest urban expressway networks that includes a large underground portion, as well as an elevated portion, is in Tokyo, where there is so much capacity provided by a high quality zero emissions rail network, both above, on, and below ground, that you actually do have some space left over for some underground and elevated expressways. But even these are unpopular, and they're much smaller than North American highways, and they're told at very high prices. And that's all possible because the vast, vast majority of people are moving via rail. Of course, just because highways are worse for cities than railways doesn't mean we shouldn't try to make railways better. The good thing is that thanks to how space efficient and frequently electrified our rail corridors are, there are a lot of options for making them more pleasant, one of the best being decking them over. Now, decking over rail corridors is something we've seen in a lot of cities around the world, but probably most famously New York, with the approach tracks to Grand Central Terminal, which were originally daylighted but were decked over and developed into lots of buildings as well as roads and public spaces. This makes the space occupied by the rail corridor fully permeable. People can walk across it or drive across it at basically any point. But you don't have to start out with this. Toronto provides another example, where there are a variety of pedestrian bridges and even now some parks which bridge the rail corridor. And in the future, we'll likely see this development increase to the point where eventually most of the rail corridor is covered or essentially turned into a tunnel. At the same time though, since rail corridors are so space efficient and safe, it's also practical to build multiple levels on them. This has been done in a lot of places, but one of my favorite examples was discussed in a recent video on Tokyo. The Ueno Tokyo line added new long distance tracks in the corridor between Ueno and Tokyo stations, in the dense center of Tokyo. And it isn't just long distance travel that you can add after the fact. A number of different areas around the world, but again in Tokyo, include people movers for local transportation that again were built over existing rail corridors. Ultimately, railways and highways are indeed not entirely dissimilar. Both are transportation corridors, and both take up space and induce demand for transportation. But the much more positive externalities and incredible space efficiency of railways simply makes them the obvious choice for transportation in our city centers. Thanks for watching.